The Death Worlders, a story by user Hambone. Chapter 21, Dragon Dreams, Part 2. It had been far, far too long since Allison had had the opportunity to enjoy the feeling of skin-on-skin -skin contact along pretty much the whole length of her body. It was made a little unusual by the smooth plastic of Julian's prosthetic foot, but other than that, other than that, the sensations of his body warm and firm against her back and buttocks, of his right arm under her head and his right hand cupping her breast, of his left hand trailing lazily up and down the shallow, athletic curve of her flank, were sublime. As were the kisses he occasionally placed on her shoulder. As had been the, well, what Julian may have lacked in experience, he more than made up for in attentiveness and enthusiasm. The way he'd communicated, the way he'd eagerly let her teach him how to use his tongue, the way he'd listened to what she wanted as his fingers played inside her. The taste of his cock, the orgasms, plural, his expressions, his moans, and generally the whole general everything, especially the way he'd kept his head and said no when she'd literally begged him to fuck her. That part she really appreciated. She became aware that his hand had stopped moving and squirmed slightly to glance over her shoulder and check that he was still awake. He wasn't. She gave it a decent interval and then carefully extracted herself from her little spoon position to go take care of the inevitable post-orgasmic ablutions, spin through the shower and put on some clean clothing. Sex, or the next best thing, had always left her energized and hungry. Louis and Amir were using the galley as well, and while Amir cleared his throat and pretended to not really notice her presence, Louis's grin bordered on being a leer. Of course, on a ship this small, there were no secrets, were there? Sleep well? Louis tried to make the question sound nonchalant and failed dismally. I had fucking amazing sex, thank you for asking. She snarled, nettled. Louis grimaced and focused on his food, ears going pink. What's that you're eating? she asked. Shu's voice lofted out of the kitchen. Sheng Yu. Huh? Fish! Shu poked her head out of the kitchen, wearing the biggest smile Allison had yet seen on her. This is amazing! she enthused. You have actual earth food in here! I just had to make something. You love to cook, huh? Shu ducked her head sheepishly apparently failing to notice that the gesture was a gowan one. Always have, she admitted. Besides, you've got to do something to help the ration balls go down, right? Too true. Allison selected a shred of white fish flesh from the plate and sampled it. A second later, half the fish was on her plate, prompting a chuckle from Amir. That was my reaction, he said. Damn, girl, oh! Shu giggled. You like? Allison nodded, masticating enthusiastically. This is amazing, she swallowed. Best thing I've had in my mouth since, uh... Okay, now the awkwardness happened, especially when Lewis grinned like he was the coyote and he'd just caught the roadrunner. Half an hour ago? Yeah! His scream was in response to Allison rolling her eyes and dumping his glass of water in his lap. When Amir laughed, Lewis did the same to him, and a good-natured three-way scuffle broke out that only ended when Shu exclaimed, Hey, watch the fish! The boys sheepishly helped straighten the table and then sloped off in search of dry clothes. Shu snorted a little. Males, she said. She apparently didn't notice the mistake until Allison arched an eyebrow at her. Ah! Men! Boys! Ah, damn it! You okay? I'm adjusting, Shu replied. It's so weird being around other humans again. Spent too long with the raccoon people, huh? Allison asked. I keep thinking in Gowan, Shu said, and thinking like a Gowan, she scowled. I just said that in Gowan. You did? I didn't... Oh, right, the ship's translator. Yeah. Shu sat down and sampled some of the fish for herself, breaking into a broad smile. Oh, this is nice, she purred. No more pureed bug guts. Uh, ew? Nava paste. It's an ingredient, Shu explained. It's actually kind of nice, but yeah, ew. 
They shared a grin, which turned into Shu, apparently thinking of something and abruptly going pink. What? Uh, nothing. No, what? Allison pressed. Just... Wow. Sex, I've... Never... The pink turned to a brilliant scarlet. Got taken before you had the chance, huh? Shu nodded and ate some of her fish. It's... Mama and Papa were always warning me off boys, she said. Wait for marriage, find a nice doctor or engineer, Chinese, of course. You know, Asian parents. She laughed and toyed with her food, as if it's the most special thing ever. And the Gowans? Xu shrugged. They were always very matter-of-fact about it, she said. You always knew who had just arranged a mating contract, and they were very open about talking about it. A contract? Yeah. Xu wobbled her head. Sounds cold, doesn't it? Just a little, Allison agreed. It's not, Xu hastened to defend them. Well, no, maybe it can be, a little. But with some of them, you could see it was more like... She giggled at a memory. There's this one male, Rigari. He's like Gowan James Bond. Really cool. Very handsome. So I'm told. Hard to tell under all that fur. I think the fur is what they look at, Shu shrugged. I don't really know. But even the Mother Supreme was like, if I was younger. Allison laughed. Okay, so they're not so cold after all. No, Shu's smile faded. I just... Wow, that's an option now. I could if I wanted, if I, if I found... Wow. Allison put her fork down. Honey, listen to me, she said. Julian and I took forever to sort our shit out, and we needed it. I'm telling you as a friend, you're going to need time as well, or you'll just wind up getting hurt. Shu sighed. You sound like Yalna. I hope that's a compliment. Yeah, it is. Shu nodded. You could always count on Mama Yalna to tell you what you needed to be told, even if you didn't want to hear it. Well, damn, there goes my party girl image. Their conversation ended with the return of the freshly changed boys. Lewis immediately noticed the lingering traces of blush on Shu's face, but glanced at Allison, saw her expression, and clearly decided that discretion was the better part of dry pants. Sandstorm's clearing, he said instead. We should be landing soon. There's another storm about two days out, though. We'll need to actually land this time, rather than hovering. Amir said. She'll need to be properly battened down and anchored. Should take an hour or so. I'll go wake Julian, Allison stood. You guys okay to clean up? They can, Shu said firmly, folding her arms when Lewis and Amir protested. Hey, I cleaned up as I went, so there's not much. What are you going to do? Allison asked as the boys grumbled their way into the kitchen. I've got mail. There were, as Julian had said, some messages waiting for her. Four, to be exact. One each from Ima, Rigari, and the Mother Supreme, and a letter from her family. She opened the message from Giamai first. The Mother Supreme was seated at her desk and gave a warm expression to the camera. Where to begin? She asked rhetorically. I think as a leader and a politician, I am better placed to understand you than many others. The life of the Mother Supreme shares with the life of a human sister the factor that we will both always be outsiders, however much we are embraced. I have to think for all the females and all the males, too. That is not an instinct that comes naturally. For you, however, I suspect the instinct is as natural as breath, and it is one that I think our species will need to learn to emulate if we are to thrive in interstellar society, but, ah, forgive me, I'm rambling. You are missed. I understand why you left our planet and why you abandoned Aima and Rigari, and I only refrained from asking you to stay because I knew it would be fruitless. Your protective instinct is as powerful as any mother's, and you have the insight to know when you yourself are the worst threat. I truly would have valued your counsel, but I would have valued it for the same reason that I could never have it. She paused and changed tack a bit. There is a monument to Tryman. 
and all the other taken Gowans now. I thought you would like to know that. The revelation of what her mother did to save the other cubs has prompted much introspection and something of a schism. We are all still sisters, of course, but things have been difficult. There is something of a swell of opinion that welcoming you into the clan was a mistake. Some mothers who never met you are accusing you of having poisoned us with alien ideas. These are trying times for an old female. Then again, they are trying times for a young female, too, are they not? But you are strong enough to get through them, Sister Shu, and you will always have a home on Gao. Remember that. Shu was still mulling over the Mother Supreme's meaning when Sanctuary shook, and a dull note rang throughout its decks, followed by Amir's voice. We landed, all hands outside to batten down. She stood up and let herself out glad to have something to do. She really didn't feel ready for the other messages yet. The business of lashing down Sanctuary was a serious one. Huge though she was, and alien tech thrusters that required no reaction mass notwithstanding, the realities of power-to-weight ratio still existed, and Sanctuary was designed to pull fierce acceleration even at sublight, relying on her giant core's power output to keep the crew happy and healthy at 20G or more. The result of that was that she was light for her size. In the high winds expected to come sweeping down the valley over the next few days, she would slide or even be picked up and thrown unless securely anchored. Kirk, Lewis, and Amir were on one side of the ship, Julian, Shu, and Allison on the other, firing cables across her hull using a modified kinetic pulse weapon, one person to retrieve and hold the cable's end, one person to crank it taut the third to operate a compressed gas gun which fired an anchoring peg into the bedrock, which Kirk had informed them would typically have been operated by a team of four armed with a lifter and a heavy stabilizing frame. Julian just carried it, leaning on it heavily to hold back the recoil. Each time it fired, the heavy chunk sound it produced pulsed right through their bodies and produced a donut of airborne dust. Shu broke the silence after the third anchor was in and they'd found their rhythm. So... Julian, do you mind if I ask you a question? Shoot. I've never heard a surname like Atsicity before. Julian laughed softly. Not a lot of people have. It's Navajo. You're Navajo? Grandpa is. Julian shrugged it off. I'm not. Chunk! Allison hefted their line launcher, checked that her feet weren't caught in a loop of cable, steadied herself, and fired. The line described a graceful arc over Sanctuary's back. How does that work? She asked. Well, Grandpa went to prison for resisting the draft. When he got out, he went to an anti-war protest where he met my grandma, and they settled in Clearwater County, Minnesota. There was a tug on the line, which meant that the other end was attached, so Shu started to crank on it. Julian grinned. Think my dad was a bit of an accident, he confided. And, you know, interracial couple in the 70s, white girl and a red skin. He waved a hand, dismissing the bigotry of yesteryear. Don't know if things were a bit more relaxed by the time I came along, or if I was just, you know, well, at least he's half white. There was a call on the radio. Heads up! And the line from the other side came over, bouncing in the dirt a few meters away. Allison retrieved it, just as Julian set the gun and fired the next anchor into the rock. Chunk! Grandpa wanted me to learn his people's ways, but... Julian shrugged, massaging the shock of the recoil out of his hands. They're his people, I guess. I'm not really Navajo myself. I don't feel that... He waved his hands. I don't know. Kinship? Shu suggested. Yeah, that's it. The bond's just not there for me. They'd gone along to some kind of a nation thing at one point, and what had struck Julian hard was that he'd felt like a white guy and had been largely treated as one. That had disappointed Gramp Etsy, but it had at least persuaded him to just let Julian be Julian. Doesn't that make you feel sad? Shu asked. Why should it? Julian asked. Maybe I never went down to New Mexico with the old man to learn the ways of my ancestors or whatever, but we still had a great time. He taught me hunting, camping, fishing. Yeah, I enjoyed it. 
so I became a park ranger. I used to spend five days a week out in the North Country keeping tabs on the wildlife. Deer, birds, fish, bears, you name it. He shrugged, watching Shu wind the crank. Guess the Cortai thought I was impressive because they snatched me up, gear and all, and stuck me on Planet Nightmare. And your grandfather? Shu asked him. Still going, Julian smiled fondly. Same old grandpa, with his dungarees and his robusto premium cigars. Pretty damn strong for an old man, too. Shu decided that the line was taut enough and plucked it, producing a bass note. Is that all of them? That's all of them. Just need to head topside and make sure they're on top of the steel plates so they don't cut into the pressure skin and heat dissipators. Care to join me? Shu nodded, apparently pleased to be invited. I'm heading inside, Allison said. Kirk wanted the airlock seals tested and he can't open the hatch himself. Julian snorted. Fucking class five species, he teased, and grabbed her round the waist for a quick, romantic kiss. When it was done, Shu was awkwardly looking at anything other than him or Allison. So how do we get up top? She asked as Allison slipped away and jogged off in the direction of the larboard airlock. Julian just turned and folded his arms, smiling faintly as he stood below the rungs recessed into the side of the ship until she noticed them. Oh! It was an easy climb in Aru's modest gravity, but Julian had never exactly been thrilled by heights. Sanctuary was classified as a modestly sized luxury yacht, but that still translated to being 40 meters above the ground at the top, buffeted by the eddies that were bouncing back and forth between the two sandstorms like a puppy unable to choose between two tennis balls. Shu seemed to be just as uncomfortable with the winds and altitude as he was. Moderate gravity or not, a fall from that height would kill, and when she held out a hand for him to help her balance, he grabbed it without thinking. Her hand was surprisingly hard and roughened from work, different to Allison's. Allison had plenty of grip strength, but her hands were softer, colder, and her fingers were more slender. Shu's hand was warm and unconsciously solid, feminine but sturdy. He tried not to notice. So, uh, what about your mother's side of the family? She asked, raising her voice to be heard over the air currents, clearly wanting to bolster her own confidence or distract herself with conversation. Grand Grand was Ojibwa. She never talked much about Grandfather because he was, uh, never part of Mom's life. All I know about him is he was Dutch. How are your parents now? Dad died of cancer when I was, like, six, and Mom left? Grandpa and Grandma raised me. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Julian kicked a cable and gave a satisfied grunt when it didn't move. Do you know where your mom is now? Yeah. After Dad died, she kind of helped his brother through it, and, well, I've got two sisters in Holland I never met. Julian shrugged. She's okay, but by the time she was ready to look after anyone again, I was 13 or so. Seemed easier to just stay with Grandpa and Grandma. Shu checked the cable nearest to her. This one looks okay, I think, she guessed. He nodded, trusting her judgment. What about your folks? He asked. Five years is a long time. Think they'll have changed much? I... She hesitated, then gave him an embarrassed smile and a shrug, flicking wind-wild hair out of her face. Don't know. I hope not. Julian nodded sympathetically, but smiled. I hope not, too, he said. But... Word of advice? You should probably brace yourself. Did you read your messages yet? She shook her head no. Only one of them. Cool. Well, you'll have plenty of time while the sandstorm passes over. There was a lull in the wind, and Shu cautiously let go of his hand to straighten and look at the scenery. It was admittedly spectacular. The river was a malachite road, its forks and junctions winding down from distant brown mesas beneath a turquoise sky. Incredible, she said, taking a step towards it. We could almost be somewhere on Earth, couldn't we? Julian nodded though he wasn't really listening. He was too busy admiring a completely different view. On autopilot, his mouth agreed with her. We could, yeah. Like Monument Valley? She turned around and Julian realized where he'd been looking. So did she. Uh, mentally punishing himself, he took in the correct view this time while Shu hastily turned her face back towards the landscape. Her ears were bright pink. No, not like 
Monument Valley's more red and there's lots of green. This is more like... Argentina, maybe? More yellow and brown, he said. He checked the last cable. And he cleared his throat. Uh, we're as anchored as we're ever going to get, I reckon. May as well head indoors. Shu just nodded without turning around. Floundering for conversation, Julian hit on the first thing that came to mind. It's my turn to cook tonight. You okay with a good steak? Shu turned and gawped at him, blush forgotten. Actual steak? She asked. Like, beef? Yep, and I can't cook anything else worth a damn, but my steaks? Oh, I can cook a steak, all right. Julian found his confidence again and grinned. I can cook a damn good steak. Wow, Shu said. Um, medium rare, please? That's how I take my steak, too, Julian agreed. Anything else is... An insult to the cow, Shu finished for him. They beamed at each other for a few seconds before the same thought struck both of them at once and they lapsed into simultaneous, mutual awkwardness. We should, uh... She began. Get off this roof, he finished. Yeah, before the storm arrives. Right. Don't want to get blown off. Uh, I mean... No, uh, well... No, um, after you? Julian was right. His steak was amazing, but the real pleasure hadn't been in eating it, but in watching him make it. It wasn't an eye candy moment, it was a human moment. Julian seemed to turn off some of his defenses in the kitchen, claiming it as his own, putting some music on and spinning around it in a slow but efficient bustle. He didn't clean up after himself as he went, just dumped everything in the sink. It was a messy and male approach to food preparation, but... But no Gowan would have ever listened to Breaking Benjamin, or nodded in time to the music, or sang along just loud enough for her to hear that he was singing along in a surprisingly good singing voice, punctuated by the sizzle of skillet and the clatter of plates and seasonings as he worked on his masterpiece. Holding on too tight Breathe the breath of life So I can leave this Look, but don't touch, girlfriend. Shu jumped. Allison smiled at her. He's taken, remember? She asked. Shu remembered to shake her head rather than shimmy it like Ima. That's not it, she said. Which was a bit of a lie, but not much of one, so it didn't count. Allison tilted her head. What then? Just humans. Hmm? You, him, Louis, Amir, the music, the kitchen, the food, humans, earth. Allison made an understanding noise and put an arm around her shoulder. Making you homesick? Actually, no. It makes me feel like, like when I dreamed of home. She smiled at Allison and wiped away a tear. This is what it felt like. In the kitchen, Julian's playlist had changed tracks and took a dizzying detour into Johnny Cash. We must have thought it was quite a joke, and it got a lot of laughs from a lot of folks. Seems like I had to fight my whole life through. Allison directed a sly smirk at Julian as he picked up the volume a bit. He's got an eclectic taste in music, doesn't he? Very varied, she agreed, covering her smile. Come on, help a girl set the table. A minute later, Shu dropped the knives from giggling at the enthusiastic bellow of, My name is Sue, how do you do? that drifted out of the kitchen. In the dark and quiet of the night cycle, Sanctuary creaked like a clipper at sea as her shields deflected the pelting sand outside. From without, the view would almost certainly have been spectacular. Force fields tended to react colorfully with airborne particulates, spitting and sparking as the charge built and ground itself, glowing all the colors of the rainbow, and others besides. Inside, the only hint of the raging outside forces was the occasional whine as the power systems intelligently redirected the power reserves and increased the reactor output to match them, and the odd structural creak as the shield emitters mounted on Sanctuary's outer skin transmitted part of the huge forces they were emitting in the ship's structural components. In theory, those force fields were more than up to the task of keeping Kirk's ship securely in contact with the ground. 
But the humans always seemed to feel more comfortable with steel than with photons, even though, technically, a force field was built to duplicate exactly the kind of electrostatic forces that gave steel cables or bulkheads their strength. Still, redundancy didn't hurt. And if it set the paranoid Deathworlders' minds at ease, architecture really didn't need much sleep next to most species. While humans took a solid six to eight hours a night, and the Govnorag needed a whole day every three or four days, Attack. got by on quick, regular power naps. In fact, the domain's standard unit of time, known as the Rick, was derived from the average duration of the attack sleep phase. Though, nowadays, given a standard definition based on something to do with hydrogen, if Kirk remembered correctly, not being able to summon random little facts like that at will was one of the few things he was finding he missed about having cerebral implants. He certainly hadn't noticed any decline in his logical faculties or powers of recall since their removal. Not for the big stuff. Maybe mental mathematics was taking a while longer and he wasn't able to recall trivia, but the important activities seemed mostly unhindered. The problem was that the disparity between his sleeping habits and those of his crew left long stretches of the night where the only available company was Vedrig. Kirk and Vedrig may have been old friends, but theirs was a relationship built on mutual esteem and shared goals rather than actually having much in common as people. Tonight, however, he had something to do, and was glad to be left alone to do it. The less his friends and crewmates knew about some of his plans, the better. By attack standards, the engineering access conduit which ringed the poles of Sanctuary's reactor was a crawl space, tight and claustrophobic. Vedrig would simply not have been able to fit into it. Humans, Gowans, and Cortai, on the other hand, could have strolled down it, though they would have needed a stepladder to access some of the systems that lined the hemispherical conduit ceiling. Kirk stooped underneath an environmental duct, stepped fastidiously over a neat bundle of high-capacity data cables, squeezed between two computer racks, and finally found what he was after at the apex of the conduit, immediately in front of the first of his ship's seven huge sublight thrusters. It was mounted in a little pedestal which doubled as a superconducting power bus of peerless capacity, designed to shunt as much power as the huge reactor could generate straight into the seemingly innocuous little oblong of sealed technology that was Sanctuary's Corti black box drive. Without knowing how to open one, tampering with a black box drive was a recipe for it blowing up in the would-be opener's face, and not in a small way, either. The Corti had an unsubtle approach to copyright protection. Kirk, however, knew how to open it. Fabricating the necessary tool had been trivial, in fact. All it did was deliver a permutation of extremely precise electrical currents to 32 of the drive's 3,000 microscopic terminals. That set of possible combinations was already absurdly vast all by itself, but when one factored in the need to deliver excruciatingly precise electrical currents to that correct combination, and the fact that the combination and required currents were changed periodically as a safeguard against simple dissemination of the information, then a value emerged that made the total quantity of subatomic particles in the whole of the visible universe seem utterly trivial. Correctly guessing the combination was effectively impossible. If an enterprising scientist were to fire a neutrino in an entirely random direction, and then guess at which specific atom it would eventually hit, then a successful prediction would still be tens of thousands of orders of magnitude more likely than a correct guess at the black box combination. No wonder it had supposedly never been opened by an unauthorized user. With the right key, however, the two sides shot outwards on rails with a snap, and the top hinge opened. Kirk reflected wryly that if life in the galaxy had taught him anything by now, it was that working technology simply never had shiny special effects deep inside them, the occasion demanded a bottled singularity pulsing ominously inside a glass cylinder, or some other such wondrous artifact. Instead, he was looking at a circuit board much like any other. It was foolish to be disappointed. Nevertheless, it felt like something of an anticlimax. The modifications he read off a standard tablet computer were the work of minutes. Connect, load, copy-paste, run, close the box, remove the key... Back in the comfort of his quarters, he settled onto the bed, folding his legs underneath him, and bade the room load a text chat interface and connect via the newly established protocol under his name. System notification. User 
and has joined the error undefined exception. Welcome, user. Uh, 25. This is getting ridiculous. That's the second one this cycle. 7. Working on it. 34. Without apparent progress. 7. By all means, you are welcome to volunteer for debugging software that has existed longer than you have. For now, I'll just kick this spurious user again. System notif- Error. Error. Redirecting subnet mask. Uh, port. Uh, system notification. Welcome to the cabal. Unknown. By working on it, I hope you mean that you draw closer to a solution that will allow our meet space guests to connect directly to the cabal. Every time one of them logs into the primary relay is a potential security failure. Unknown. So long as Seven remains in charge of it. Unknown. I know for a fact that Fifty is working on the problem themselves. Unknown. Shouldn't we be welcoming our guest? Unknown. Ah, you're right. Please forgive us, uh, Jim. Kirk snorted, amused. Self. Think nothing of it. I don't wish to be a liability. Unknown. In which case, the fewer the occasions on which you connect to this channel, the better. At least until we can complete the task of securing it. Self. That seems reasonable. Please, brief me. He sat back and let the explanations roll in. School is exactly as Shu remembers it. But isn't she a little old to be back at school? No, of course not. She's 16. She must be 16 because if she's not 16, then she wouldn't be in school. QED. There aren't many people around, though. They must all be in class. She'd better hurry. Shu's locker is number 99. She remembers that fact quite proudly. Top row, second from the right, in the long corridor near the changing rooms. She doesn't remember walking to it, but there it is. She opens it and grabs her bag. It bites her. Sharp teeth. So many teeth. Too many. She flails and beats the hunter around the head with her free hand, trying to escape. It emerges from the locker like a foul magic trick. Like a blasphemous birth. But she manages to get her hand free and run. Why is she running? Stupid question. This is a hunter. It wants to eat her. But she's killed dozens of hunters, hasn't she? Still she runs, though. Running, running, running. Feet pounding the tiles, her hair streaming out behind her. Except she isn't scared. This isn't a chase. This is just her morning jog. She isn't at school anymore. She's running along the waterfront in Stanley Park enjoying the cool breeze. There's a sculpture of a man sitting on the rock out in the water. He looks familiar somehow. He winks at her and tosses her a tiny object, which she catches. It's a metal ball, about the size of an apple. Somehow, looking at it, she knows that the world is going to end, but that she can stop it from happening if she just... She realized that she was dreaming and woke up. Mourning was a concept that Cortai, Gowans, and humans held in common, and which had become enshrined, thanks to the Cortai, in interstellar timekeeping. It had created a fortunate rhythm to the day that Xu had been able to exploit, and she had grown into an early-to-bed, early-to-rise routine that was totally at odds with the nocturnal Vancouver nightlife of five years ago, and more in line with something her mother would have approved of. She was up well before everyone else. Amir, it seemed, was an early riser too. He was just getting up from his prayer mat as she emerged from the gym into the common area. Five times a day, huh? She asked. He paused in tidying the prayer mat away. Is that a problem? He asked. Proving that getting up early didn't automatically make you a morning person. 
No, just making conversation. Amir softened and nodded, pinching his nose. Sorry, he apologized. I'm too used to Lewis bickering with me over it, and he's up early today for some reason. Bickering? Amir nodded. He keeps trying to deconvert me. It's obnoxious. Oh. He puffed a little laugh out of his nose. Let me guess. You think this is strange? He gestured to the prayer mat. I don't want to argue with you. We only just met. Shu protested. Seriously, though. She hesitated. I'd kind of forgotten that prayer is even a thing, she admitted. He scoffed. Right. The galaxy full of atheists strikes again. Are you always this grouchy in the morning? Amir blinked while Shu folded her arms and channeled Mama Yolna, waiting for the verbal slap upside his head to do its job. Okay. He finally let out. You're right. Sorry. Lewis just... Never mind. I shouldn't take it out on you. No. Shu agreed, but smiled. But it's okay. Galaxy full of atheists? Ah, that's just Lewis's new argument. Amir dismissed it. If nothing else out there believes in God, then blah blah, you get the picture. Doesn't that make you wonder, though? Shu asked. Nope. Why should it? Look at all the gifts we have. We're faster, stronger, smarter, tougher, more creative. He turned to her. Seriously, what's Gao in pop culture like? Pop culture? Yeah. Do they have sports teams, rock stars, reality TV? How about just commercial radio? Is there a Gao in Banksy or Coca-Cola? What about their phones? What's their uh, version of iPhone versus Android? Do they have somebody like Arnold Schwarzenegger or... Who's the Gowan answer to Imran Khan? I don't... Who? Amir wound down a little. He's a cricketer. A famous one from Pakistan. He explained. Chu thought about it. They have most of that, she said, though admittedly she had never really absorbed much of it. Perhaps the part of Gowan pop culture she was most familiar with was an edutainment show for little cubs called Yin Ni Wo which was more or less the Gowan equivalent of Sesame Street, minus the puppets. she learned half her Gowan from watching that show with Myun and the Cubs, though apparently it had left her with a childlike way of speaking for some time. Well, they're doing better than most of the aliens, then, Amir remarked. But I bet it's not as rich as ours, or as varied. If you say so, Shu said neutrally, too offended to argue with him. That's my point, though. Amir continued, Look at all the gifts we have, all the advantages, all the blessings. To me, it's obvious. Shu was rescued from having to come up with a response to that by Lewis sticking his head through the hatch, looking frazzled and sleep-deprived. Hey, Shu, could you give me a hand? Sure! She sprang up to her feet, gave Amir a little wave and a smile and joined him. What's up? Well... I could do with some more exercise advice, but I was mostly just rescuing you, Lewis whispered, once certain Amir was out of earshot. Don't get him started on that shit seriously. He was okay, she said earnestly. He's just passionate. Trust me, you give him the chance and he'll go way past passionate and into downright fucking intense. The lady doth protest too much, methinks right? Shu glanced back toward the common area. Amir had sat down and from his expression was plainly pissed off at himself. Maybe, she agreed. And wow, you quoted that correctly. Hey, I'm not here to be the ship's mascot, Lewis smirked. No false modesty, I'm like one of the smartest people you'll ever meet. I know Hamlet, not really my scene, but I still know it. Shu blushed a little. Sorry, I didn't mean to imply. It's cool. Where I went to school, pretending to be dumb was a survival strategy. Lewis reassured her. But yeah, it's been a touchy subject for him this last week or so. Used to be it never came up. Now he gets all sharp real easy. 
don't know if that means he's getting more devout or if he's having a crisis, but it's best to just, like, avoid the subject entirely. They reached the flight deck, where Lewis's usual nest was a riot of articles, videos, and blogs on Tai Chi. You have internet? Xu exclaimed. We've got, like, a backup copy of part of the internet, Lewis said. Godzilla bites of it. Pretty cool, even if it's a couple months out of date. But you're researching what we did yesterday? Yeah, Lewis said, dropping into his chair. I actually enjoyed myself, which is like a major first for me. I'm glad, Shu replied. I have a good teacher, Lewis told her, and grinned when she smiled at the compliment. I got up early to try and join you in the gym, but then... He waved a hand at one of his screens. Looks like something came up overnight. Shu looked at what he'd indicated, seeing only incomprehensible numbers in text. What did? Not sure, TBH, he said, actually pronouncing the abbreviation letter by letter. He turned to that display and dragged it onto the big screen front and center. I've got all kinds of monitor programs and bots installed in Sanctuary. This one logs power draw in the FTL. He poked a finger at the screen which flashed blue where his digit passed through the hologram. I won't bore you with, like, the Starfleet techno babble here, but TLDR, those numbers are the wrong numbers. Wrong how? Couple hours of sporadic power draw starting in the middle of the night. Not big draw, but we're landed and powered down. The FTL shouldn't be drawing a dang thing. Shouldn't we go check it or something? No point. I've got the full diagnostic right here. He waved at a screen. Piece of shit alien engineering doesn't log half of what it should, though. My bots log everything. But the modules themselves? Eh. He shrugged. All I know is there's nothing actually wrong with it. It was just drawing power at O Dark 30 last night when it shouldn't. Still? Yeah, maybe. If it keeps happening, I guess. It could be the sandstorm for all I know, though. He dismissed the program. I'll keep an eye on it. I should probably go do that exercise while I'm still fired up for it. Give it a bit. I need a shower, and then I'm making pancakes for breakfast. Lewis perked up and imitated Homer Simpson. Mmm, pancakes. She giggled. I'll give you a lesson afterward, if you want. Lewis looked like he'd been given an early birthday present. Sounds good, he agreed. See you at breakfast. See you at breakfast. She smiled and left him, pleased with herself for navigating a whole conversation in English with human body language and no screw-ups. Today was definitely off to a good start. The sandstorm took nearly a week to clear. They had been, for Lewis, six very pleasant days. There was still the unsolved mystery of the power draw in the FTL, but that had only happened once and came in a distant second place to spending time with Shu. Julian, however, had developed the annoying habit of warning him off. Bad idea, he was saying for the third time that conversation. Seriously? You said yourself you'd like her to stay on this ship and help out, dude, Lewis pointed out. I would, Julian agreed. But she wants to go home. So, maybe if she's got somebody here, she'll... What? You want to make her change her mind? Julian snorted. Everyone does that to everyone, bro. That's what a fucking conversation is. Julian paused, tried to formulate a retort, and then aborted the attempt with a shake of his head. Whatever. It's still a bad idea. Lewis choked out an exasperated noise. Why? he asked. Damaged goods. Shu's been without healthy human contact for five years, man. Great. Healthy human contact's what she needs then, right? Healthy human contact, yes. Asking her out is healthy, dude. Good for the self-esteem. Whose? Yours or hers? Julian asked pointedly. Lewis folded his arms and frowned at him. What? Hers? Both? It's human contact, dude. I thought you said she needed that. 
Yeah, but... Julian flapped a hand as he hunted for the best way to phrase his thoughts. Drip-fed. Gradually. You don't throw a hypothermia patient straight into one of those really hot Russian saunas. Dude, it's not like being asked on a date is fucking hard mode. She says yes, it's just going to be movie night and dinner anyway. That's about all you can do on this ship. She says no, cool. I can handle being turned down. Lewis, I spent six years alone. I know what I'm... Shu didn't, Lewis interrupted him. She had the Gowans and the aliens. They don't count. Lewis looked offended. Aliens don't count? Kirk, of all people, doesn't count, huh? Julian stood his ground. I like Kirk. I respect him. I've followed him through a lot. But he's not human, Lewis. Alien company's nice, but humans need humans, and it takes a while to adjust when you've gone without for that long. She's adjusted to Allison just fine. Allison's a woman. Sexist, dude. No, listen. Julian was getting irritated now. She spent those years with Gowans, and you've seen her. A lot of the time, she slips back into their language, their expressions and mannerisms. She's gone native, man. And given what I know of Gowan's society, that'll have primed her to connect better with women than with men. Guys? Sounds like a fucking good reason to give her some human contact then, Lewis protested, his own hackles raising. Normal human contact. Slowly. Guys? Being asked out is normal. Guys! Lewis's arms paused mid-outraged flail, and both of them turned to Amir, who had turned in his chair to break up the argument. Lewis, listen to the man. Julian, stop being jealous about Shu, he said. Julian swayed as if he'd been punched. Jealous? he asked. Okay, that was maybe the wrong choice of... Amir began, but was interrupted. Yeah, jealous, overprotective. Acting like you've got a right to choose for her, Lewis stabbed. And you look at her pretty much the same way you do Allison, dude. Amir pinched his nose. Lewis. Julian gaped at him. I... What? No, I don't. Leave some women for the rest of us. Leave some... How fucking medieval are you? Julian stabbed back. Julian. You're the one who thinks he's got a shot at a fucking harem, dude. Julian's fist bunched and his tone got dangerous rather than outraged. You want to watch? Guys! Julian and Lewis paused again. The moment of tension rang like a dropped knife, and then Julian's hand uncoiled and his shoulders dropped as he exhaled. Sorry, Lewis, he said. That was... Yeah, that wasn't cool of me either, dude. I'm sorry. The two men cooled off in silence for an awkward minute until Lewis added, But you do stare at her, dude. Julian glanced back down the bridge access corridor to make sure Allison wasn't somehow there to overhear him, then nodded, sheepishly. It's... She's got a shared experience with me, you know? We've both been alone for a long time. It's nice to have somebody around here who really knows what that's like. In fairness, we all look at her. She's bloody gorgeous, Amir pointed out. Right. Julian nodded curtly. And don't think I don't notice when you two check out Allison either. Ah, come on, dude, Lewis said. There's a difference between that and being a horn dog. You don't just check her out, you full blown stare. And it's not fair on your girlfriend. Okay, okay! Julian put his hands up defensively. Just... Nobody's in control of their lust, Lewis. Amir opined. Not really. Do you mind not calling it lust? Julian asked, irritated. That makes it sound so... That's what it is, though. Infatuation, if you prefer. And Lewis is right, it's not fair on either of them. It's not exactly fucking fair on me! Julian objected. I'm not doing this deliberately. She stares at him too, Lewis, Amir pointed out. What? No, she doesn't, Lewis objected. 
Oh, face it, she does, Amir asserted. And why not? He's a specimen. But she's spending time with you. Julian scowled, but Lewis just looked pleased and smiled, giving him a defiant stare. Oh, yeah, so she is, he agreed. Guess she's settling for second best, Julian growled. What? Lewis's arrogant grin evaporated. Fuck you! Get in line! Okay, what is wrong with you two? Amir stood up and stepped between them. This isn't like either of you. What's going on? Just sorting out the fucking pecking order, Julian snarled. All right, piss off out of my flight deck and don't come back until you've got your head out of your ass. Julian rounded on him, but Amir stood his ground. Go. Cool off. We'll sort this out later, he repeated. Julian looked like he wanted to argue, but just made an angered sound, spun and vanished, his angry stride all but denting the deck as he went. And you, Amir rounded on Lewis, you've been insufferable these last few days. You're picking fights with me, with Julian. What's going on? Maybe I'm just... Lewis began and then shook his head. Ah, never mind. I'll be in my cabin. When they were both gone, Amir sat and wiped off his forehead, willing his heart to stop pounding and forget the flash of violence that had risen in Julian's expression for just a second. It had been like staring down a dragon's throat and seeing a glow. He hit a button. Hey, Kirk, there's been a, a bit of a row up here. We should probably talk about it. All right, guys, that's going to do it for this one today. Thank you so much for being here with me. I really do appreciate you. Sorry it took so long to get this next one out, guys. I have just been all over the fucking place trying to deal with a thousand different things. Um, I'm getting offers for, for doing more commercials and things like that, you know, just like little 30-second spots and stuff. But trying to do those and also work and also do this and, you know, all that fun stuff. I mean, I'm not complaining, uh, obviously. You know, it's all good stuff. <laughs> but it does take time, and sometimes I have a problem with managing my time. Um, undiagnosed ADHD or something like that. I don't know. That's what people keep telling me. I'm not sure. But hey, do you guys like, uh, like horses? I like horses. I used to ride them when I was a kid until I went to horse camp. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I, I do like horses. They're fun to ride, but, um, two of them have taken off with me on them and I haven't been able to stop them. Like I, I try doing the thing where, you know, you, you, you pull the reins the way you're supposed to and just, uh, you know, pull back a little bit. And then just kind of lean into the the stirrups and everything, but it did, it didn't work. He just kept running. It was terrifying. They're so strong. And then he fell, and it felt really bad. He could have broken his leg. That was not fun because he got out onto the asphalt and slipped. It was scary, but he was okay. It was all right. Thank goodness. But oh yeah. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I appreciate you. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, uh, go to the Discord, say hello to everybody, join the general chat. Uh, there's lots of different stuff over there these days. Food, television, books, movies. Uh, you know, don't go to 50-50 unless you have a strong stomach. I'm just going to say that right now. Just be careful in there. Know that this is not a... It's, it's eight, how do I set it for 18+. plus? I'll have to look into that. But anyway, guys, um, I love you so much. I hope you have a great one. And I'll see you later. Bye, y'all.